Hello everybody, my name is Brooke Joseph and I'm an 18 year old innovator at a program called the Knowledge Society. I'm really excited to be sharing a few things I've been interested in and I've been working on. I'm extremely interested in the intersection between cybersecurity and artificial intelligence and specifically looking at how we can address um, training AI models using sensitive data, especially as more and more research comes out that tells us that oftentimes these models actually memorize the data that they were trained on, which obviously is a big invasion of, of privacy. So we kind of want to make sure that we are protecting the client's data. And another reason why I'm so interested in sort of this niche intersection is because a lot of times we see shiny new objects and shiny new tech and toys or whatever, and we get super excited about them. And then we kind of consider the consequences after the fact when it's usually too late. I'm really interested in kind of being at that front right now and seeing how we can address it before it becomes a big issue because when there's there's data use, you know, we have to make sure that we're protecting that data, especially if it's sensitive information that we don't want disclosed to the general public. And that's kind of what I'm really into. So that leads me into the topic of today's presentation, which is federated learning. Federated learning is a new AI setting that was developed by Google back in 2017. And FL really, in my opinion, effectively addresses the issue of, you know, sensitive information and like the data privacy of clients. And so the idea of federated learning is that we can train AI models in a decentralized fashion, which essentially means that we can take advantage of the idea that data is born on edge devices and we can send over models to these edge devices to, you know, train them and then create a whole new model. Okay, so I know that's a little bit of a lot, <laughs> a little bit of a lot. But we, I, I'm going to break this down and we are going to make sense of this. Okay, so the first part here, we have these de edge devices. So when I say edge devices, I mean like a computer, a phone, a laptop, whatever. Computer and laptop are the same thing. But <laughs> we have different devices. And so essentially what we do all the time, we are constantly producing data on these devices. So every time you text a friend, every time you like a post on Facebook or LinkedIn or Instagram, and every time you, know, you watch something on YouTube or type something into your computer, you are constantly producing data on your device. And we can actually take advantage of that. And what we can do is we can actually send over models in the form of software, apps, websites, whatever it is. And we can actually take the data that is locally uh, born on this device and then train the model while keeping the data completely on the device. So the data never leaves the device. And after a certain amount of epochs, so basically after running through the training a certain amount of times, training this neural network, what we have are new updated parameters. And those new updated parameters are actually going to then be sent back to something called the central server. And the central server is going to be like, if a big tech company is using it, it's gonna be located at one of their big offices. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna take all of these updated parameters and it's gonna use an algorithm, um, most famously is the federated averaging, and it's going to essentially aggregate each of the data points. So that means, you know, kind of make a weighted average of all the, the, the parameters that were produced by each of these devices. So that's cool, right? Because then we get this new model. This new model is sent back and then this process continues over and over again until it converges, which is basically fancy lingo, lingo for saying that the engineer is satisfied, they're good. So you just want to please the engineer. <laughs> so after the engineer is satisfied, the process is done. You know, all this sounds great, right? Because we have the data that is produced by the client staying on the client's device. And yes, I would argue that this does somewhat effectively address sort of the privacy um, issues that a model or a client would be facing. Yes, I agree. But at the same time, we are still sending these raw updated parameters from the device to the central server. And so what we can actually do and what is kind of being tested right now is figuring out a way that we can marry something called differential privacy with federated learning. Okay, let me step back a little bit and start with differential privacy. So differential privacy is actually somewhat of a complicated topic and it is essentially uses very complicated math and probabilities to ensure a certain level of privacy to clients. 
and how this is done is using various different mechanisms. So there's like three main mechanisms that throughout my research and kind of learning about this, I found. And so that's the Laplace mechanism, Gaussian, and then exponential. The Laplace mechanism is um, typically for less common and it's because that is because it has pure differential privacy and then the Gaussian is more commonly used because it kind of has approximate differential privacy. Okay, I'm throwing out a bunch of words here. So the main idea of differential privacy is that we take these continuous distributions. So back in high school, when you learned about, you know, the normal distribution or the, the Laplace distribution, whatever, all these different continuous distributions, we can actually take bits and pieces of the graph and add continuous noise to our data set. And that becomes a very difficult, you know, for hackers to intercept um, that, that communication. And so what we can actually do is we use this Gaussian mechanism, this, this, um, this like differential privacy mechanism way of adding noise. And we use that to essentially add noise to the updated parameters before they leave the device to the central server. That way, you know, we're masking the, the actual, you know, information and we're sending it across to the central server. And then that mask kind of like ensures that, you know, the attacker won't intercept the, like that communication. And if they do intercept it, then it's fine because they'd have to ask a bunch of queries to, you know, to get the actual information, which by the way is possible, but very difficult because once you kind of decode it, if you will, you have the updated parameters and then going from the updated parameters back to the data set is also a challenge in and itself. So this does ensure a very high degree of privacy and security for the client's information. Before going a little deeper, I would like to quickly explain how differential privacy can be added to and be used to in federated learning. So there's one of two ways that it can be used. Number one is local differential privacy and number two is central differential privacy. And so um, in application, usually lo local differential privacy is the way to go, depending on what you're looking for as a company or whomever is using it. And so the main difference between the two is that for local differential privacy, you have a higher level of privacy, but a lower level of model utility. And then for central differential privacy, it's a lower level of privacy and a higher level of model utility. And so kind of on that topic, there's always like this privacy uh, accuracy trade-off where you can only have a certain level of privacy while you're, you're sort of ensuring a certain level of accuracy and model utility. And which makes a sense, it's pretty intuitive because again, we're adding this noise. So the more noise that you add to the original point, the further it, it is away from the original point, but that just means that um, that point is really private. You know, it's really far away, so it's kind of hard to get back, right? But if it's that far away, how useful is that point, right? Like if it's so far away from the original data point, how useful is it to us who are trying to make a useful model for people to actually use. And so it's important to kind of consider this trade-off when kind of picking what you want to use and how to go. And actually there's a lot of research going into kind of optimizing the trade-off between the two and kind of figuring out how that works. So that is kind of um, the main background information. I would really like to jump into an example now. So um, in this kind of code here, I break down how it's possible and how you can actually use something called TensorFlow Federated and TensorFlow Privacy to work with these two things here to kind of code and make it all possible. So the very first step to creating your own model is to actually create the model. Okay, that seems pretty intuitive. So if you are familiar with working with neural networks, this should be a cakewalk for you because all you're gonna do is use Keras to make a model. So this specific example here is a very classic example. It's using the MNIST data set, which if you're unfamiliar, is kind of pictures of drawings of uh, pixel, 20 by 20 pixel numbers. And so those drawings of numbers are kind of used to uh, have a computer kind of determine what the letter four looks like, number four, sorry, not letter, number four looks like, what the number five looks like, what the number six looks like, and all that. And then we have like these hidden layers and then the final layer, if you're familiar, it's fine. And then the important part of the code is essentially converting, if you will, the model that you just created, the normal neural network into a federated neural network. So after you do this, you can move on to determining the amount of clients. So an important thing 
to understand with FL is this idea of par parallelism. So this essentially means that we can train a bunch of models at the same time, which is good, yes, but it's important that we actually have the liberty to pick how many clients we want trained at a single time. And that's just because someone like me and you who are more li more than likely just using a laptop to kind of like play around with this, we don't have access to a bunch of memory, a, a lot of computational power. So five clients like this example would be appropriate, but someone like Google might use like 10,000 clients at the same time because they're testing things out, they're researching, whatever. But that's just something to keep in mind is to kind of like remember that, you know, like a lot of clients requires a lot of computation and a lot of like computational power. So after we add, uh, we convert the model, we add the amount of clients we want, we actually have to train the model, of course, and then we add differential privacy because it's a crucial part of the training process. So essentially what we do is we have the noise, uh, noise multiplier, which is the actual differential privacy there. We want to add noise locally to the device because of local differential privacy. And that's the main idea there. And then we go through the whole training process and then we actually have to set up the aggregation process on the server side. So we can actually do that by setting up a client optimizer, a server optimizer, and then just creating this whole aggregation process as it, as it comes and then we actually have the evaluation process as well where we're actually creating um, once we created the model we want to evaluate how well it's performing so all in all that's kind of what I've been investigating throughout my 10 months here at TKS I'm so so excited to see what the future holds I'm really excited um, kind of about this field as a whole because I really do find that federated learning is such a promising field specifically when we add differential privacy because the combination of the two really makes it possible to kind of train models and also kind of ensure a certain level of privacy for the data that's actually being used and again like i said in my opinion it's very important to address these two i would like to say that kind of like next steps on my behalf i'm really interested in looking at how we can make privacy more accessible for people and companies especially smaller companies not the big like anything in the s p 500 because you know obviously they have access to a lot more uh, uh capital to invest back into their company and whatever so i think it's really important that we can make it more accessible because when you are considering privacy oftentimes it's an afterthought because there is no return on investment not really technically so you know from a business standpoint why would they kind of invest in that if there's no like incentives if there's no no reason that they're no way they're getting back their money back on kind of what they're spending and so i'm really interested in making it very accessible so that a lot of people and companies can have it and so and this can be done by making a general privacy preserving model which is quite interesting and it's actually very difficult because each industry has their own privacy guarantee that needs to be met and so it kind of plays to that where you kind of have to figure out what is a happy medium, what works for everyone. And, you know, when you're in Europe, you know, you have to comply with GDPR. And then when you're in the States and Canada, there's different rules and regulations for everything. So it becomes messy and complicated. And that's another reason why a lot of people just don't use it, right? So yeah, thank you again so much for your time. I am so incredibly uh, excited and I'm honored that you clicked on this video. And yes, thank you so much.